Welcome. I'm going to share with you a number of subjects that have been in the news recently on climate, weather, space weather, and astrophysics. One interesting item that was in the CBS News recently was the military use of space. It turns out that the military spend more on space than all the other US uh, agencies combined. That's NASA, NOAA, NSF, DOE, and uh, etc. The US military have identified a new threat, at least they claim to have, which is when uh, China demonstrated an ability to destroy satellites in space in 2007. This threatens the US surveillance uh, systems. The Chinese blew up one of their old meteorological satellites as, the, as a test bed, and this caused great fuss and was denounced by the US. But I think they have very little justification in complaining about this because they did exactly the same thing, but to a working solar satellite, Solwind or P-78-1, in 1985 and they also shot down a British uh, science satellite UK-1 with one of their nuclear explosions in the mid-60s. But the interesting part that came out of this to me was that there's over 25,000 pieces of space junk orbiting the Earth. That, that's defined as something the size of a, a grapefruit or larger of which only 1,300 are operating satellites. So there's an awful lot of space junk up there. The US military surrenders to the UK weather. US military operations depend on accurate weather prediction. The Pentagon has just announced that it has decided to use the UK Met Office weather forecasting models starting next year instead of the American models. Now you might ask, why? The US Congress has been cutting funding for Earth sciences at every opportunity it can for the last uh, decade or more. Now the current Congress is proposing a $300 billion cut in Earth sciences. That's 30% of their budget. This was once considered the best investment in science at NASA. It improved weather forecasting, it's gathered large amounts of climate data and developed climate models. It's monitoring pollution across the world, both the sources of pollution and the areas affected by pollution. So this is very valuable stuff that we're going to be cutting. And these cuts have uh, continued for a very long time. And remember also inflation eats away at these budgets. So Earth science is, is but a shadow of where it was before. And uh, some of the other countries now have surpassed the US capability in climate and weather modeling. The sad story of the California drought continues. Here's a three year plot of what has been happening to the state of California. And you can see how the, the drought has spread and, and deepened over that period. This has led to Governor Brown imposing a 25% cut in water usage for urban areas. This includes restrictions on watering of lawns, usage at home, and also restrictions on car washes and golf courses. All of those are quite reasonable. But there is a problem associated with this. The urban uses, particularly the ones covered by these restrictions, use a tiny fraction of the, of the water that California has. Nearly 80% of it is used by agriculture and the oil industry. But the, those industries only represent about 3% of the California economy. They have imposed minimal restrictions on the use of water by farming and the oil industry. And many of those will not be phased in for many years, particularly the ones on the usage of groundwater. Those are so far in the future that the estimate of most of the uh, water districts are that the groundwater will all be gone before these restrictions actually come into play. Well, we had a major volcanic eruption last week. A Calbuco volcano in Chile erupted, uh, sending clouds of ash up into the atmosphere. But it did something else to the atmosphere which was very interesting. The NASA Suomi NPP satellite saw these waves emanating out from the volcano. As explosions occurred, waves radiated across the atmosphere. These are called gravity waves by the atmospheric scientists because gravity is the restoring force that makes these oscillations propagate. So they're called gravity waves, but those should not be confused with gravity waves as the astrophysicists talk about them. Those gravity waves are when you have two massive bodies rotating around one another and they modulate the gravitational field being uh, radiated from those particular sources. Like rainbows? How about four of them? This is a quadruple rainbow. They're incredibly rare. In fact, the first photograph of one was taken in 2007. They occur when you get a double rainbow and their counterparts are reflected from atmospheric structures behind. This was uh, taken from Long Island. When will our luck run out? No major hurricanes have hit the US for nearly 10 years. And if it none hits this year, then this will set a new record. But a NASA sh study shows that this is just dumb luck. There's been just as many large hurricanes formed in the Atlantic Basin as there is normally. 
They're just most of them have missed the the North American continent. So at some time in the none too distant future, our luck is going to run out. The problem is, is that people have now got used to not having these major hurricanes come ashore. People are moving closer and closer to the shore, and when one of these comes in, there's going to be a lot of problems. We often hear about how inefficient, ugly, unreliable and costly wind power is, particularly offshore wind power. But a study done by Mike Parr of Energy Post shows that wind turbines are more efficient and produce cheaper energy than either nuclear or natural gas power generators. And as an additional point about that, China's wind power has now just surpassed the output of all the United States nuclear power stations. So they're obviously going into this in a big way and very successfully. One of the measures of uh, whether global temperatures are changing is the dates of first and last frost, the dates of snow melts and things of that sort. Stevens Pass in Washington State uh, on average is clear of snow by the 2nd of June. This year the pass was clear by the end of April which beat previous records by several days. Uh, this probably has something to do with the fact that Washington has had 14 consecutive months with above average temperatures. Five months in the last year have set all-time records for the high temperature in the Seattle area. We often hear arguments about whether uh, global warming is causing more extreme weather. An article in Nature seems to indicate that it is. A new study concluded that global warming uh, has quadrupled the frequency of heat waves in the last 200 years. But the scary part of this particular paper is that if we continue on the rate we are going at the moment, in the next century that number will have increased not by a factor of four, but by a factor of 64. So it'll get 16 times worse than it currently is now. That's going to be bad. You often see on the uh, number plates of cars from Oklahoma that Oklahoma is okay. But as far as earthquakes concerned, Oklahoma is not okay. The earthquake frequency there is increasing alarmingly. A decade ago, typically Oklahoma had one to two magnitude three or greater earthquakes a year. Is now experienced about two per day. And that included a rather a hefty 5.7 recently. This corresponds to a huge increase in the amount of fracking in the deep rock strata to extract more oil and gas. Anna, unfashionably early. The uh, first named storm of the 2015 hurricane season is Anna and uh, it's formed off the uh, Carolina coast this week. That's nearly a month earlier before the official beginning of the hurricane season. That doesn't necessarily mean we're going to have a particularly intense hurricane season. This is not unknown, but it's just, it is just very rare. Oh, and our old friend the Daily Mail is at it again. It has this headline in its newspaper. Our climate models are all wrong. Global warming has slowed. Recent global temperature changes are just natural variability. IPCC does not take natural variability into account in its models. This is all referencing a article by Duke University. The slight problem with this is that the Duke University study doesn't actually say any of those things. What it does say is the most extreme scenarios adopted by the IPCC models are inconsistent with the current data. But they go on to say, but that might change. They say that global warming is being masked, not that it's disappeared or slowed, it's being masked by short-term natural variability, as was forecast. This is not that global warming has slowed, global warming can continue on at about the same rate. It's being masked by things like an extended La Nina period, by volcanic eruptions, low solar activity and many other the natural factors. But all of this was understood and considered in some of the models. It goes on to say that the IPCC middle of the road scenarios are currently accounting most accurately for natural variability. So the, the IPCC does take natural variability into account, it's just that some of these factors are not predictable. So you don't know what they're going to be, so you take a number of different scenarios. The most extreme scenarios are very pessimistic estimates and uh, you hope that they're not going to be achieved. Then you take optimistic scenarios which uh, set the lower bound of what the temperature changes will be and then you adopt several in intermediate or middle of the road scenarios that you think are most likely to occur and that's what that's what's happening the models are corresponding or the temperature changes are corresponding to those middle of the road scenarios at the moment